tidbit about, like I said, this one grazing system here, you can see there's 500 pair down over the hill there. This pasture right across the fence has not been grazed yet. We kept that, we're gonna be branding this weekend. Usually that would have been done, but in 100 degree weather, we had to keep pushing it off. So we're hoping we can get it done this weekend. This was, uh, it's got about 60 days rest on, had these 500 pair in here for about three days or so. These paddocks are 80 acres, which is our last split. I always tell folks, you know, find what works for you. And then, and as you move into this, then you'll find, you know, if you want to get a little more uh, intensive or, uh, you know, downsize a little more. And that's kind of what we did. I told Alan, we started out after his grazing school way back in the 80s. This was one great big pasture and we just split it twice and moved those cattle twice during the year. And I liked what I saw. And then we split a little more and we split a little more. So um, this had be, when I was a kid, this was season long grazing that, and it had been a bit abused because this was a pasture we used after, when we branded and after we branded. And the diversity had really narrowed. You saw a lot of blue grama grass. And what I'm kind of proud of, and you can really see it over the hill a bit, but those hills over there on the horizon, that was solid sand when I was a kid, sand duny sand. And that's covered with big blue stem and little blue stem now. And it's by taking a lot of cattle in there. And we sometimes will run a herd of yearlings and we had 2,300 head of yearlings in there and it just tore the heck out of it. But a little moisture and all of a sudden, boom, 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 shoots came up where you didn't have any grass at all. So I'm proud of that we're widening that now. Alan says we're going to be, he's going to be critical here because he wants you guys to learn. So if he gets too nasty, I might leave. <laughs> no, but I want to get these guys on and let you guys talk. Who's first here? Well, I, I can, okay. um, here, I think we got to get this on. Oh. No. Don't kiss me. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody heard that one. No, have, I, what, have I got to use this too? Is this working? Yeah. And it's coming over that? I've got hearing aids, so it all sounds funny to me. Uh, I did make the comment to Jerry. I, I really appreciate him making his land available, letting us come onto it. But we're here to learn. So if I just please him, yeah. it's not going to be the right thing to do. And this is a, an awkward position I'm often placed in with one group in who'd gone to a lot of trouble to honor me and all sorts of stuff in New Mexico. And we went out on the land and they told us about what they were doing. And then they asked me for comment. And I just stood there and I said, I, I don't know what to say. I said, I can be polite and thank you for honoring me and all the good you, intention you have, but I'll be dishonest. Or I can be honest, but it's going to be blunt. And what do you want? And they said, we want honesty. And so we, we actually had a constructive uh, discussion because what they were showing me was terrible. Now, what he's showing me is not terrible, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but what has rescued him is where he is on the brittleness scale. Right. So he's got 16 inches of rain. And I knew the answer already, but I just wanted to confirm with him. When I looked at this ground, I realized, oh my God, they've got almost no dry periods throughout the year. This is a fairly non-brittle environment. This is so forgiving. That's true. You can do almost anything. And the only place it'll really show up badly is species disappearing or on the sand dunes, the slopes, it'll show bad right. on the slopes, which it did. And now he's seeing recovering. So this is moving forward. But to me, um, it, it, it could be a lot better considering the years he's been at it. Now, that's not a criticism because he's wisely gone step by step, didn't have follow-up, didn't have support. But if we could have somehow been supporting him daily almost or weekly or monthly, we could have said, OK, that first encouragement you did, let's, let's step that up further. Now, the other thing I'm going to pick on um, not to be nasty to him, because I want him to buy me a beer later, um, is we only think in words. Try to think without thinking in words. 
Okay? Now, if we watch our words carefully, it changes our thinking. So he said a couple of words here today that shocked me. And I realized, oh my God, we haven't been supporting this guy. Okay, what were the words he used? He said, he referred to this grazing system. The, we've abandoned grazing systems. Don't ever use that word again. Grazing systems do not work. Period. Okay? The only place you can use a management system, the only place, is where everything is predictable. So, on, in your businesses, on your farms and so on, you would be wise, I would advise you, to use management system for your accounting system, your inventory control, anything in the business that is predictable. Use a management system. Now, if you use an agricultural management system, an educational system, uh, an economic system, a grazing system, God help you. You're on your own. I promise you it'll fail. No, now, military people have understood that hundreds of years ago. They used to fight battles with a set system. Infantry in a square, cavalry on the right, artillery on the left, archers in the rear. They bashed away at each other. And they realized this is stupid. No army today fights on any system. Because they know you're guaranteed to lose. If you run your business, you're grazing, anything on a system, I'm not even going to waste time with you. You're guaranteed to lose. It's too unpredictable. Okay, so try to get to talking about planned grazing and then you will begin to plan grazing. Because nobody who's planning grazing says I'm on a grazing system. They don't use that wording. Now, if you pick on the wording and have fun with each other, don't, don't make it nasty, have fun with each other, you'll find the learning speeds up. And I used to do that in training groups and say, okay, you guys pick on me. Anytime I use the wrong word, pick on me. Stop me immediately and I'll do the same to you. And we'd laugh as we caught each other. Hell, at the end of the week, the learning was so much quicker because we watched the wording and then the thinking changes. Okay, so um, that, that is one. And the other thing that you used that you will eventually drop is you referred to rotational grazing. Right. Yeah. You, you see, don't do rotational grazing. Lots of people are. It's understandable. You'll get away with it in climates as benign as this. But if you were doing this exact same thing in New Mexico, you'd have fallen on your ass already because the climate's not so forgiving. If you're doing this exact same thing in Zimbabwe, you'd have fallen on your ass already. Okay, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just read the original, read Vozan. That's my, my wife and I got his book republished so that you could all read it. You can get it from Island Press. Um, he studied rotational grazing systems which they've had in Europe for two or three hundred years, and they're not working. They're not working anywhere. They're losing biodiversity. Okay? So try and get off that, because we know that doesn't work. It's a system. It's prescribed, etc. And just go to planned grazing, which works, or Vosanne's grazing, which is a simple form of planning, which works. And Vosanne's grazing would work extremely well here. We adopted it uh, 40, 50 years ago in Africa, thinking no point in reinventing the wheel, this guy's invented it. So we just took Vazan's rational grazing, planned, rational, thought out uh, grazing. We did it in Africa and we fell on our asses. The complexity of Africa, the brittleness scale difference between that and France and Germany was too great. Thank goodness we realized this man is not wrong. The technique he's using is too simple. We've got a deal with more complexity, more wildlife, longer dry periods. We've got to find a better technique. And the technique we do use and advocate that you use and you can train on it, you can learn to do it in a day, is the planned grazing. Okay? Now that, we've never ever had a failure. Not one single failure since we established that, which was in about the mid to late 60s. Why have we never had a failure with that? simply because it's got 300 years' work behind it. It doesn't come from me. I just cribbed the military. If the military had worked out over 300 years how to take anybody, train them quickly, and enable them to produce the best possible plan right now under immediate battlefield conditions, how the hell was I going to improve it? Why try and improve it? 
I just cribbed the army. I was learning it as an army officer, I was using it in the military. Hell, I just took it and started using it on the farm. Exact same technique. It's, that's why I always credit Sandhurst Military Academy with the grazing planning. It didn't come from range science, it came from the army. And it's just an incredibly, painfully simple way of planning and it doesn't break down. We can't make it fail. And tonight I'll show pictures of that where before we even let it go on the public, we put in two projects, one in low rainfall, one in high rainfall. We called them advanced projects, not trials, because we were trying to make them fail. And trying to make it fail, we could not. It just got better and better and better. So if you can make it fail, you'll be the first in the world and we'll let every hub in the world know immediately if you can make it fail. If not, use it. So that's what we do is encourage it. Now, with the, what happened here, you've got it from Jerry, this is improving. My criticism is the rate is too slow. For his family, for the community, for everything, this could be speeded up. So there's no criticism of what he's doing, it's the rate. If, if this had been, if we'd been able to coach you and be with you, We'd have just speeded it up, speeded it up, speeded it up. Stand for a couple of weeks then? Is that yeah, the plan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A month or whatever. Months, yeah. Yeah. And I'll buy you more beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and part of that is going to take thought from you, so you guys can be part of this. What I am seeing is hundreds of ranchers doing what you're doing. This was a big pasture. We split it, we split it, you're splitting it. You see they're down to about 80 acres with about 500 head of cattle. That is pathetic because this is under rest nearly all the time. He said this is getting two months of rest. No, no, it's getting 12 months of rest. It's getting two months of recovery. Now, words. The land does not need rest. Rest is destructive to this land. What is slowing up the progress here is the amount of rest. Okay? The plants need recovery. The soil needs recovery from trampling. So what you're actually doing without realizing it is you're practicing rotating partial and total rest. That's what you're actually doing. Because the biggest influence is what the land will respond to. And we've over centuries thought that overgrazing was the biggest influence. No. We thought you could overgraze land. We teach that you can overgraze land. There's not a single textbook I've found or PhD dissertation that even defines overgrazing. We didn't define it because we knew what it was. It's too many animals. And then we learned from Wazan that it's not too many animals. It's a time factor. All right. So we teach, and you see that today, and we believe that you can overgraze land. No, you can't. You cannot overgraze land because land is made up of soil and stones and trees and bush and, and all these things f functioning together. All you can graze or overgraze is plants. So you have stopped overgrazing plants. You see, with the simple planning, the rotation you've done, I don't see any overgrazed plants. That's great. So what's happening is when the cattle are coming into this, they're not overgrazing plants, they're grazing plants. That's healthy. When they get in this paddock, it's, the two influences are grazing of plants and partial rest of the land. Because his animals are not excited. They will bunch here and there, and when you put the bigger herd together, there, they right. bunched more. Right. You've got a bigger result. Right. And you saw it. Yeah. And that's what you've got to keep building on. Right. Okay, so when the animals are out of this paddock, what's happening? Total rest. So really, because rest is the biggest influence, you've got a rotation of partial and total rest. Now, I wouldn't know these things, I wouldn't understand these things, if I wasn't being given the privilege and the opportunity to be on hundreds of ranches seeing what you're doing, knowing how long you've done it, etc. And then also living on a property where we're doing the same thing as you're doing, but we're doing it with many elephants and buffalo and lions and giraffe and 
sable and everything else. And in making our decisions, holistically, we could not use fencing. So our stock density is far lower than yours. Our density is like it used to be in North America, very low. When you had millions of bison here, the stock density was incredibly low because the paddock was the whole of the United States. Do you see it? So the density was very low. But the herd effect, the animal impact, was extremely high because you had herds of 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, one herd after another. You had very high impact. We are doing that same thing now. So all ours is herding. And the results on the ground we are able to see. And you've been and seen them. Some others have. It's been phenomenal, far faster than we can achieve with, with fencing. So I realize now, OK, the fault here and on many ranches is mine because I was teaching people just to use fencing. If I could wind the clock back, I would now be saying, hey, let's, let's look at herding much more or combinations of herding and fencing because we are seeing such phenomenal change just herding with no fencing. Now the reason we're doing it is best described with one of the students we had. He'd been with us, a young African, and then I brought him over here and we were on a ranch in Texas of almost the same size and almost the same size herd of cattle and sheep and goats. So we had almost identical size of ranch, size of herds. And I said to him, as we went over the land, he saw like this many forbs, not a lot of species of grass, things moving, but moving slowly. And I said, how does this compare with what you saw in Africa? He said, oh, there's nothing like it. What, what we're doing in Africa, you know, he'd been there for six months. He said, it's just moving, many more species of grass, much more litter, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, well, what's the difference? The ranches are the same, rainfall's not all that much difference. One is in America, one's in Texas, I mean, one's in Africa. And then I said, now come to the cattle. I said, when you were in Africa and you went to the herd of cattle and sheep and goats, where was the nearest animal to you? And he said, well, yeah, I could touch it. I said, where was the furthest animal from you? He said, oh, 50 meters over there. I said, where was the furthest animal on the left? He said, 20 yards, 30 yards over there. Where was the furthest one on the right? Just over here. So he was describing a herd of 500 head of cattle day and night on one acre of land or less, day and night, throughout the year. I said, now you're on this ranch in Texas with fencing and not herding, same side cattle, where's the nearest animal to you? He said, oh shit, 100 yards over there. Where's the furthest one? I don't know, can't see it, I know. Where's the furthest one on the left? Can't see it, where's the, all right, can't see it. They just day and night spread. And that, that physical impact, the hooves of the animal, is the main thing giving us the recovery. So here, I'd just say, wonderful what you've done. Encourage you to think of those terms. Get to the planning, learning, go back to it, learn how to do it more, and just start trying to find ways to step up the physical activity, just so that the, what you observed over there happens here too. And just speed this up. Um, there's your land's not deteriorating, it's improving, you're probably getting more carbon into the soil, everything else. And my criticisms are purely in your self-interest to speed it. Right. Yeah, because I think you could go a lot faster. And then we're going to have to learn how to do that together, because I don't know how you do that here. Does it mean putting, herding your cattle some of the time? Herding whatever, I don't know. Oh, for your interest on the ranch in Africa that I'm talking of, when we began, we had a hundred head of cattle and it was deteriorating badly. The rancher was going broke when I bought that ranch. We have gone through 10 bad years now. A couple of them at average rainfall, the rest below. Last year, the driest anybody's ever known in history with 500 head of cattle. So we've gone from 100 to 500, produced the incredible result. And we absolutely forced to try to increase and double that number now and go to a thousand, just to keep pace with the production of the land after ten poor years. And I think you can do the same here. So does that mean he should have more cattle in here? <laughs> Probably. I'm, I'm not. I, I married a rancher, so I mean, I don't. Hmm. I never grew up and raised with this, so I'm very, very beginning learning. That's a good thing sometimes. So, <laughs> 
I'm a nurse. <laughs> totally different thing. Um, so what I'm, uh, what I, the way I understand it is he should have more in here more frequently. Yeah, it, it, as we were saying back there, or Byron was, you've got every decision has got to be made in your own self-interest, economically, so, et cetera. And when you're making the decision, a very common thing with ranchers is uh, when they begin, just as he did, is they want to put in fencing. That's the commonest reaction. And many of them put in radial layouts and a lot of fencing. Even though I said, don't do that, uh, many did it. What most ranchers need to do is first start increasing the cattle. I'm going to talk cattle, but it could be sheep, goats or anything. Because almost every ranch that I've ever been on is overcapitalized. In other words, too much money tied up in the value of the land, the buildings, the pickups, the salaries, the family to be supported. That's a lot of money tied up for very few cattle to pay for it. So it's overcapitalized. And they get pushed by extension services and anywhere, everyone to improve the cattle performance, produce the cattle production, etc. No, because you're doing that with more costs, although they're variable costs. And if you just take the stocking rate, the number of cattle, and double it, it changes the economic picture completely, even if your cattle performance is poorer. And we actually worked out with statisticians in Africa that on the average ranch there, if we could double the stocking rate in the first year, which we ended up doing routinely, if we could do that, uh, as long as individual performance of animals never fell more than 40%, and it never ever did fall that much, as long as that never happened, we would always make more profit, consistently make more profit. Now, the uh, Ohio State, Deb Steiner and co. did a research paper, published a paper here, where they followed the early practitioners in the United States who came uh, to me for training at that time. And those early practitioners averaged 300% more profit. And at that time, suicide was the leading cause of death and 600,000 families went broke over that same time period. Yeah, so it makes a big difference. And one of the big differences there is, as you begin, is the importance of looking at the chain of production. So on any business, but particularly in agriculture, you've got sun coming to plants it's got to be converted to a product, it's got to be marketed, and then you've got a dollar. And if you look at any average ranch that is overcapitalized, you shouldn't put money into the link that is not the weakest. And if you put money into the fencing, it means you're trying to increase the amount of grass grown, really. You're trying to increase that production of that link of the chain, whereas what you're needing is just more cattle. And so normally, uh, we would try, and what, certainly with what we know today, to get the people just to start jump, lumping their cattle, going to fewer herds, plan the grazing, even if you only got four or five paddocks, doesn't matter. Start with what you've got, but start getting the cattle numbers up so that you can deal with the overcapitalization. And then as you generate the money, you put in the fencing. And ideally, um, you, you shouldn't put in the developments like fencing and water and things until they are earning money. If you're putting them in when they're costing money, you're doing the wrong thing. So that's the financial planning that we try to teach people to think like that. And it's very critical. Uh, one way I try to get farmers here to think about it is I just say, what did it cost to develop America? You know, if we thought like farmers do today, nobody would have sent anybody from Europe over here. They couldn't afford it to develop this country. This is the wealthiest country that's ever existed, and it was developed by Americans with creativity and raw resources. If they thought like you do today, nobody would have come here. Couldn't afford it. Your farms, your ranches are wealth. So you've got to build up from that. What are you doing in Africa? Are you so, really hurting them? Yeah. So your question was, what are you doing in Africa? She just answered. Yeah, it's hurting. I, I just wanted to or add to one thing Ellen said and then turn it back to him. Uh, with his military planning procedure that he took, one point that we can add to that was what the military did over 300 years there in, in Britain, they learned how to put all the factors they had to think about down on a piece of paper graphically so they could see it. And the very last thing they did was put in, well, where does the military go? 
where do the people go? And when we when we adapt that, when Alan adapted that for the grazing planning, everything we need to remember goes on there. And the last thing that goes on is the cattle moves. And I think that's that step up from rotational grazing where you really truly are monitoring and creating much, much more than you thought you could. And, and um, the other answer that I, I wanted you to address a little more, can you speak briefly, Alan, to when you walked here and you said you saw it needed, you know, after the years it had come slow and you weren't seeing what it could, can you describe that to us, what you're seeing and why? Because you just walked on here today. Okay. Yeah. Um, remember, I'm used to seeing land because I've been reading it like a book for years and years and years from the air and on the ground. Is that and still on? Yeah, and um, so knowing he'd gone for many years, I would have expected to see many more species of grass, um, less forbs. I, I'm seeing a great many forbs, and, and I'm not seeing a lot of diversity of species of grass, and that immediately alerted me, something's wrong. This is stagnating. It's, it's improving, but so slowly. And I had this with a, um, a rancher not too far from here in another state uh, that bison producers. I'd actually been on the ranch when they began and got them started. They'd been under a person who trained with me, and they'd done beautiful grazing planning. They've never dropped the planning. Um, and they've done beautiful monitoring. They involved the university in it and the trained guy, and they monitor exactly what's happening on the land. And it was six years from when they'd got started, and I was with them on the ranch and saw it, and then I revisited. And we, they drove me all around the ranch, and I was disappointed, and I, I didn't know what to say. Because they're such nice people, they've done such a good job. And then I thought, well, I've just got to be frank about it. So at the house, I said, look, I'm disappointed. You, I can see you've improved, but it's just stagnating. This is not going at the rate it should. And I cannot find out what's wrong. Your planning is beautiful. Your monitoring is beautiful. But this is disappointing to me. And I said, is there anywhere on the ranch where it's really improving? Because if we can find somewhere and then work out why, it'll give us a clue. And they said, no, there's nowhere. And I said, well, let's take another drive around. And we drove around again. And we were coming along a fence, hitting another fence. And we, the car stopped. I got out of the truck to open the gate. I looked through the fence on my right, and I just got excited. I just dropped the bloody gate, leapt through the fence, walked off into the uh, land there. I was looking at it. It was just so many more species, different color in the grass, healthy, healthy water cycle, everything. And they came through the fence, and they said, well, we thought you might be excited. I said, this is what I was looking for. What did you do differently here? And they said, well, it's not one of our paddocks. It's just a holding trap. See it? Holding trap. That was the one place the animals milled in a big bunch periodically. And it was totally different. And that's what I didn't see here. So even if you looked around, like you gave me a clue when you said over there you saw a bigger improvement and you said bigger herd it's really of cattle. It's hard to get there with a group, but yeah. you would see more of that. Yeah, and you said 2,000 head of cattle, right. not 500. You see, 2,000 makes a difference, that bigger herd. The first researcher to prove me wrong was a personal friend of mine, and he published a paper on how wrong I was and how if you increased the herd effect, etc., you wouldn't get the results I said. And I said, well, I need to visit your research. And the gammon was his name. The paper still cited sometimes. We went in Matopa's research station in uh, Rhodesia, as then was, and as we drove, I saw a acacia tree and they, I could t see two stairs under the tree, and I couldn't see any other cattle. Finally, I said, Mick, where's your herd? He said, there they are. And I said, Mick, what are you doing? He said, well, we've got two tier stairs on acre plots. We're rotating them around acre plots. And I said, if they both get excited, is it a big deal? <laughs> I said, if they both crowd under the tree, is it a big deal? He said, what are you getting at? I said, look, if you had 100 acre plots and you put 200 steers in there and they crowded under that tree for shade today, you'd get a totally different effect. He couldn't see it. Do you see, it's the same stock density. It's not about stock density. It's about behavior. So I've tried to make that much clearer in the new textbook and how 
you can go for higher stock density in these less brittle environments. You'll do well, you'll be happy with it, but it could be better. And then if you get to the bigger ranches, and particularly with longer dry periods, like you have in New Mexico, Arizona, whatever, don't even waste your time with stock density. Start going right away to herd effect. Try to get the behavior change in the animals, which we get through the herding. See, with the herding, the animals' the behavior is changed all the time. And at night, they go into an enclosure to protect them from the lions. And it's, again, it's very high impact, and that moves every week. So where it's very highly impacted, that moves every week. So it, we're out on the pasture, we need to move, then we can at least see something different. So think about a question, and let's go that way about 100 feet with a group this size. We won't go 100 yards. And you can just drag the sound along, right? Yep. And follow us. So let's, let's go over the hill here a little bit. Yeah. I think they want you up there. Uh -oh. One question on the way over was, what do you do for water when you're moving? Come on down, Al. Uh -huh. With a group this big, again, just uh, get where you can see the best you can. You know, water many times is the most limiting factor. A couple of things. When we got that cloud cover a minute ago, it was like uh, a little bit of relief. There's lots of good litter on the ground here. There's cover for the small insects and microorganisms. That's one good thing that's here. The cover is there, and if it's decomposing into the ground, the better. If we take it all off, you know, forcing us to stand here in the sunshine would be like forcing those um, my to live without any litter on the okay. ground. And it's so about, at what point can you do two months? Uh, do you want to do it so that they can? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Tell him. A, a question just came to me, and I wanted Alan to respond to it because, and I think all of us struggle with this. Okay, we're going to put more numbers or more impact on this. At what point do you know that you 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 went too far? I mean, there's some point there, and can you respond to that a bit? Yeah. Um, if you go too far. Okay, what you'll find is the cattle performance will drop off and the land will get better. It's the exact opposite of what happened under continuous uh, and grazing systems and so on. In the past, if you exceeded things, your land deteriorated before your animals. And that's what's been happening for thousands of years. Land deteriorated, animals didn't. Um, if you plan the grazing properly and you over exceed it, your animals will drop off, it's your warning, your land will actually get better, as long as you don't break the planning. And that's what we did, and I will show you the slides of it this evening, on the advanced projects where we tried to force failure, and we couldn't cause it to failure, it just got better and better. Yeah. I'd just like to make one point, because I think we've observed that with the big herd of the yearlings, and Josh, you, you know, it's one of the struggles we had. We could really make the improvement on the land, and we saw it on those sand duny hills, but then we drop the performance on those, and when you're, yeah. you know, dealing with yearlings that you want to gain on, then it was a struggle. And yeah. so I was constantly fighting myself about yeah. where is the balance, and yeah. that's I think the biggest challenge. Yeah, it, it is a challenge. And and one somebody asked me as we were walking down about uh, forcing the animals to eat selective uh, grazing. That's one of the things that's been a bugbear for for a long time. In the early days, in the late uh, early 60s, when we were desperately trying to sort this out and work out how to use cattle, a botanist in South Africa, John Acox, did some wonderful work. He gave us part of the clues to this. And what John was doing, he was a botanist studying the advance of the Karoo Desert in southern Africa and how the grasslands had given way when the millions of springbok and eland and all these animals had gone. Uh, the springs started to dry up, the grassland gave way to desert. And he developed a solution to that, he believed, which was non-selective grazing. And he believed that if you just divided the land up into 16 divisions, stocked it very highly, each one, and grazed until the plants were evenly grazed and moved on, everything would recover because he reasoned that the plants had disappeared because of selective grazing. Now that was logical, it made sense, it fitted observations, and um, I went down and visited John, spent time with him, looked at ranches he was working with, and uh, I was excited about it. And then much like I mentioned just now with the, the ranch, I visited the Howells, Len and Denise Howell, who were practicing that, 
with a lot of sheep in the, in the Cape. And when we went around, I was disappointed in what I was seeing on the land. And once more, I got excited when I saw one corner where it was very different. And I said, what happened here? And what it was, was a lightning storm. So there was a big storm and all the sheep crowded into a corner and they had very much higher impact. And I got excited about that. I said, you give me a key. We've got to get this impact up and not, sele not stop selection. The animals have to select at a high rate. If you force them to eat and you stop selection, their performance will drop, guaranteed. So we don't do that. So when you look at the herded animals we're using in Africa, when they come out of an area where they've been herded, the commonest remark of visitors is, why the hell have you taken them out? They've hardly touched anything. Well, the answer is they've been here three days. It's time to move. And they're, they're selecting at a very high level. It doesn't matter. It wasn't selective grazing that was the problem. It was oxidation that was the problem. And we had missed that. So non-selective becomes an absolute no-no. Don't force the animals. You will get a drop in performance. If you have to force the animals for a land or other purpose, then pick a period in the year in the planning when you can do it. So if you pick a period with, say, when cows are dry and pregnant, they're as tough as hell. You can afford to drop at least 15% in body weight and you'll actually improve their performance. So that's the time you do it. If you're going to force anything, is that window of opportunity. But with stockers or grazers or lactating cows, don't do it. They'll drop. Yeah. Yeah. How about uh, leader follower grazing? Can you get the same impact without losing production? Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, that's one of the steps in the planning. Yeah. Is, 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 Repeat the question. Yeah, the leader follower. In other words, if you do a follow through, if you've got, uh, let's say I had 10 paddocks here and I have two herds. And for some reason, I have to have two herds. Now, what are my alternatives? I can run all 10 paddocks with, both, uh, w with two herds. So each herd will come through every paddock, and I can plan it that way to get short grazing periods and recovery periods. Or I could allocate paddocks. So I could say one herd is bigger than the other, or more important, it's uh, first calving heifers or whatever, more important, so I could allocate it six paddocks and use four paddocks for the other herd, but still plan the grazing. Or I could say, okay, one herd is going to market earlier, or whatever reason, they, they're more important, and I could do a follow-through. So one, uh, usually the smaller, more important herd, will come into a paddock, and when it goes out, the next herd will come in that day. So it's a follow-through. And you can follow through with up to three herds, if you like. You can have high, high milking cows, uh, the best milkers first, then the, the average milkers, and then the poor ones, or whatever, following. Okay, it's just, it can be done, and you work it out. And in the textbook that's explained, in the training it's explained, and you just choose which is best for you. Now, it, it, choosing this moment to explain, because a lot of people don't get why, why not rotate. Uh, what flashed through my mind there was I was visiting a, a farmer further east of here. He was much publicized in grasslands, Stockman Farmer, what do they call it? Uh, really nice guy. He had trained with me, a really good farmer, doing uh, all the right things, etc. And I visited him and I picked up that he had dropped the planning and was rotating. And he couldn't see anything wrong and he was doing well. Uh, when I looked at it, he'd had a particularly wet year, not a dry year, it was particularly wet. He'd run out of grass and he was having to lease additional grazing. Now, there were warnings there. And I said, well, why have you dropped the planning? Well, it's so simple. This farm is so simple, I don't need that planning. I can just do it in my head. And I said, do you mind if I pull out a chart and we actually do the planning? He didn't mind, so we did the planning. He was wasting money. He didn't need to lease land. He just had too many herds. All he had to do was amalgamate herds. And all that money being wasted on lease would have been saved, and his animals would have been improving his land more. And we picked it up immediately in the planning. Rotating, he couldn't pick that up. 
We'll do a simple test this evening at the talk. I'll do a simple test. And then if any of you pass it, you do rotational grazing. And good luck. We've got about five minutes. Can okay. I take one more question? Then we're going to go to the other side. Okay. I got a question. You would like to see more herd impact on this particular piece of ground. That'll kick it and jump start it. And you were talking about not really liking a lot of fencing. Well, we do perimeter fencing, but we use temporary to pick sections out. And I mean, we can we can tighten up tight with that without having to increase our numbers big time at this point. Is that an option? Yeah, it, it's an option, but it's not a, a very good one. That's why I said we'll we'll have to work it out. And it would be nice to work with you on it and through the hubs and things as we talked about. Um, I can't do it now because we'll waste too much time, but I can explain it to you. If we were in one room, and I often do this, some of you have probably done it with me in the past. If we were in one room, okay, all of us, and I said, okay, we're cattle, what's the stocking rate? And it would be the number of cattle in this room. What's the stock density? Be the same number of cattle in this room. And then I would say to you, okay, all of you crowd up into half the room, and I actually crowd you, despite the desks or everything else, into half the room. And I say, now what's the stocking rate? Double. No, it's exactly the same. What's the stock density? It's now double. And they'd all agree with that. And I'd say, now crowd into quarter of the room. And I'd cut crowd them into quarter of the room. And I'd say, now what's the stocking rate? It's the same. What's the stock density? It's doubled again. And I'd say, now, go into an eighth of the room. And I'd crowd them in and ask the same question. And then I'd do it again. And I'd keep doing that, and I would stop the moment the noise level arose. Because all throughout that, it'd be quiet. And at a sudden point, everybody's voice goes up. People start laughing, joking, and you've reached the point where their behavior changes. OK? And you have to go to a high level. To get that behavior change, you have to use too much fencing. That's why, uh, again, I've tried to make it very clear in the new book. Do it if you're on a small farm, low brittleness environment, pasture, something like that. If you're on a big ranch, big tracts of land, don't waste your time. Start looking at other ways. Now, other ways that we're developing are the herding, uh, putting dogs periodically. If you just have dog, a uh, man with a horse and a couple of dogs, for part of the day, just, just bunching the animals, just simulate the wolf, just getting them crowd somewhere, attractants, just finding ways to get them bunching, excited, moving. Yeah. Is your water portable or something like that, where you move it to an area so they stock dense higher? Well, so it the is. Is, is the water portable sometimes to get that stock density higher? Yeah, many times, and a lot of creativity there. For, for the sake of time, Jay says we need to start to head to the other. Before you move to, for just a minute, before we go to the other site, what Alan's really f referring to is when he looks at the land, like, I just dropped it there, but next, well, I'm seeing some lichen or some moss covering ground. I might like to have a plant in there and have more density. The land is telling him it has more potential than it's being used and how to then improve that. But keep in mind, it's got to fit the holistic context of the people involved. That family might say, we are just fine financially, we are just fine socially, we're just fine with our workload. We don't need to go to any higher stock density, or and that may be where they are at that point. It doesn't mean that it's where they could be. And here, you're not seeing tremendous soil erosion or bare ground, so you're at least at a point that's not damaging the land and putting silt you know, and sand to leave. So it's got to be done in context. And so many times we get specific questions on actions of what should I do with a fence or cattle or etc. Just make sure you don't go away thinking that any action has been encouraged over another. It truly depends upon your context. It doesn't just depend. It depends upon your context, what you're trying to do, where it fits for your financial. Okay, Jay, anything to say? How we go? Here you go, Daryl. I think we're going to end up taking off here, uh, unless anyone has a real pressing question or anything for Alan. And
virus. Uh, we want to hit to the cover crop site. It's going to take us a little while to get there. Okay, let's go. We'll answer over there. We can. You can answer the questions over there as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's I'm give Jerry and Byron and, and Alan a hand. Uh, very very informational yeah. stuff. Alan, you want to say something? Well, thank you. I'll, I will skip off now to take a break, otherwise I turn into a pumpkin or whatever it is, because uh, I'll see some of you tonight, or most of you tonight, and we'll go through some of this again. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you.